All right, as you're finding your seat, you can go ahead and start finding the book of Jeremiah. That's where we're going to be this morning. Those last couple of pictures you saw on that, uh, I think Anderson and Mike are like, what, one week apart? They've been into stuff together for a long, long time. So you saw a lot of those pictures of them together. Here's what's interesting about a day like this, because I wanted to say some things to our seniors, and we did that on the other side of the wall over there uh, in between services. But when I was thinking about this message and thinking about our seniors, I was thinking, you know, there's some things that I want to, to make sure that we give them some last thoughts before they transition. But I thought, you know, I wonder if those same things will be relevant to the rest of us. And then I basically thought back to most of my conversations with, with some of you and, and thought, you know, the lessons that we want our graduates to learn are probably some lessons that we uh, as older adults should relearn. And so that's really the heart of what we're going to do today. And we're going to look at this passage in Jeremiah 29, 11. Parts of it I think will be familiar to you. But you heard that song on that, on that video. It's a, it's a song called Dear Younger Me. And, and adults, those of you that have been kind of uh, longer on the journey of faith, have you ever wished you, that you could go back? Or have you ever looked back at your life and thought, you know, if I would have made a different choice here or a different choice there, I would have. Or if I could go back to some of these things, some of these relationships in my life, I would have done something different or approached that in a different way. That's really the heart of what that song is. I want to read you the first couple of stanzas in case you missed it. It's, it's a song by Mercy Me. Here's what it says. Dear younger me, where do I start? If I could tell you everything that I have learned so far, then you could be one step ahead of all the painful memories still running through my head. I wonder how much different things would be. And it says this, dear younger me, I cannot decide. Do I give some speech about how to get the most out of life or do I go deep and try to change the choices that you'll make because they're choices that made me. And even though I love this crazy life, sometimes I wish it was a smoother ride. Dear younger me, you know that song, if you look at the backstory from Mercy Me, they, they talk about a time that there was a guy in their life that was a friend of that band and he went through a really, really horrific time in his life. And, and mercy me, those guys were trying to figure out the best way to extend the ministry to him. And so really the stanzas of this song were really uh, an exchange thread and some text messages. These were, these were statements that they were sending this friend of theirs that was going through some really, really difficult things in their life. And I thought about this song and I thought about the lessons that we learn and and I thought about those of you that are, that are like me or, or a little older than me or a little younger than me. And we, we have been on a long journey, but not always in the right direction when it comes to things of faith. And I thought, you know, so much of what I want these graduates to know is they kind of go to this next stage in their life. I mean, these are lessons that many of us need to relearn. Or maybe some of us, we need to learn for the very first time. But when you think about life, when you think about the journey, especially when you think about kind of discovering God's plan, God's will for your life, I think that comes with a really great tension. And I think the heart of that tension is this, is that sometimes our expectations of life don't turn out the way we wish. Right? The, as we start out this journey of our life, or if we go to a new season of our life, we we kind of craft for ourselves these expectations. I think life is going to go this way and, and I'm going to go to this school and I'm going to study this and then I'm going to do this career. And, and adults, we do that in, in various phases of our life. We, we create for ourselves a, a list of expectations. But you know what we often leave out? We leave out the griefs. We leave out the pains. We leave out the struggles. We leave out the hurts and we leave out the chaos. Right, so here's what happens. And here's why I think this is a great tension in our lives. And one thing I want our graduates to remember is is most of the time in our lives, our expectations won't be fulfilled in the way that we think they'll be. Because so often when we think about those things in our mind, about how we think our lives or how we desire our lives to go, we leave out some of the tough times. We leave out the hurtful times, which really end up being times that we learn the most. We, we forget that, that part of that tension is when our life collides with our expectations and we likely imagine the life we want just without all the hurts. Here's part of the struggle with that tension. Is if we're not careful when our expectations aren't met, it can change our view of God. Meaning we say this, you know, I'm, I'm starting this journey in my life, whether I'm a high school graduate or I'm an adult or I'm starting a new season. Maybe I'm about to be an empty nester. Maybe I'm about to be this. And, and here are my expectations for how this part of my life is gonna go. 
Well, again, most of the time we leave out the times of hurt, the times of pain, the times of struggle, the times of grief. And so if we're not careful, if we're not grounded in our understanding of who God is, then those times when our expectations aren't met, it can cause us to change our view of God. Maybe he's a God that can't be trusted. Or maybe he's a God that's really not involved in the everyday cares of our life. Maybe he's a God that's, that's so big that I can't really know him. And, and if I have these expectations of my life and all of a sudden those expectations are colliding with hurt and pain and grief and struggle and chaos and wrong choices. And, and so now all of a sudden we're wondering where God is. We're wondering how we relate to God. And we're wondering, God, how come all these expectations of my life aren't being met? And so whether we're a graduate, a young believer, someone who's not a believer in Christ, but's on that journey of figuring it out, or maybe we're someone who's been on a long journey of faith, here's the great news in all of this, is that scripture always meets us at the place of our tension, right? When we have spiritual tension in our life, like I wonder about God, or I wonder about this, or I wonder about what's next, and anything and everything, scripture always meets us at the place of that greatest tension, which is why I always say to our Students and our graduates today and to us adults, we have to be in God's word every day, every day. Of course, we should practice all the spiritual disciplines. We should be generous and we should practice stewardship and we should be worshipers and we should pray and meditate and memorize and all the other things that scripture says. But if we can only do one, be in God's word every day because scripture always meets us at these points of great tension. And I want us to look at a passage today in Jeremiah 29. And I think aspects of this reading will be familiar to. But what I think this passage will help us when we have it in context is when we are really evaluating the course and the journey of our life, especially as we frame that through this idea of what is God's will for my life, I think this passage will help us. And once we have a better understanding, a greater understanding of God's will and how that's found, discovered, and lived out, I think it takes a lot of pressure off of our lives. So we're gonna read in Jeremiah chapter 29, starting in verse 10. And in just a few minutes, we'll go back to chapter 28 for a little context. So Jeremiah 29, starting in verse 10. Here's what it says. Jeremiah's voice. For thus says the Lord, when 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will visit you and I will fulfill to you my promise and bring you back to this place. This is what you've likely heard before. Verse 11. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans for welfare and not for evil to give you a future and a hope. Then you will call upon me and come and pray to me and I will hear you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. I will be found by you, declares the Lord, and I will restore your fortunes and gather you from all the nations and all the places where I've driven you, declares the Lord. And I will bring you back to the place from which I sent you into exile. You probably heard parts of this verse, maybe not in the full context of that passage, but I want to get into what it means. But before I do that, I want to get into what it does not mean, right? Because this is, this is one of those verses in, in Christian life if, or faith life, if you put it that way. It's, it's a coffee mug verse, right? It's a, it's a poster verse in the Christian bookstore. Or maybe if you're super spiritual, it's a, it's a swanky tattoo type verse. I mean, this is, this is a good one. If you just take verse 11 and you just live it out and you take it and you create your own context for it, it's got a lot to it. But there's a couple things I think we have to understand as believers that it doesn't mean. First is this, is this verse does not mean that God only has prosperity in our future. It does not mean that. Some of the translations of this verse say this, plans to prosper you and not to harm you. And when taken out of context, we can easily believe, well, God, this verse has to mean that your ultimate plan for my life is a life of prosperity. God, that you don't want me to have hard times. You want me to prosper, especially materialistically. So, So God, if I do what's right, if I make the right choices, if I look for you and discover you, and I choose all the different things you want me to choose, then the end of those choices has to be prosperity. That's not what this verse means. Because the reality is, is most people, not all people, but most people will find themselves in a season of life where they are greatly struggling financially or greatly struggling materialistically. And when that happens, then the theology of that verse breaks down. If God only has for me prosperity, if I make all the right choices, then God's ultimate promise is to bless me with material things. Well, when things go bad, when things are hard, when you lose your job or when things don't add up, then the theology of that breaks down and we can't ever allow a verse to mean something that God never intended it to mean. And so this verse does not mean that God only wants for us prosperity. Here's what it also does not mean. 
It does not mean that God never wants for his people to go through struggles and trials. This verse reads, plans to prosper you and not for evil. And some have interpreted that to mean, well, if, if you choose what God wants you to choose, if you seek God, if you seek his will, and you land on all the right choices that God has, then you will avoid struggle, then you will avoid hardship, you will avoid pain, and you will avoid grief. That's not what this means. There's no way it could ever mean that because it wouldn't line up with the rest of Scripture because nowhere in Scripture does God promise us that we will be free from trouble. In fact, if you look at the, at the full greater narrative from beginning to end of Scripture, it actually promises us the opposite. It actually promises us that we will have struggles, that we will have trials, that we will have pain, which is why one of the things that God promises us the most in Scripture over and over is what? I will never leave you or forsake you. Not because he's promising that we won't have troubles, but he's promising that we will, and he's promising that even in the midst of those, I will be with you. So this verse just cannot mean that God only has prosperity for us, and it certainly can't mean that our lives will never have struggles and sufferings. And by the way, let's, let's just say Jeremiah wanted it to mean this, right? And so he's delivering this to God's people, the Israelites, and, and he's saying, look, God doesn't want us to have struggles. He doesn't want us to have hard times. They wouldn't have believed him. His audiences were, pe- were people that had disobeyed God to the point that their punishment for their disobedience was that God had sent them to be refugees under King Nebuchadnezzar in Babylon. So even if Jeremiah said that's what it meant, they would have said, that's not what it means, man. We are in bondage. We are exiles. We are living as refugees. So there's no way this is what God wanted it to mean. So they wouldn't have bought it anyway. And I think a modern day understanding is the same. We know the story of our life is what? that there's struggles, that there's trials, that there's pains, and that there's grief. So this passage can't mean that. So let's look at it in totality. What does it really mean? What Jeremiah explains there in 10 through 14 and 29 comes on the heels of what happens in chapter 28. So Jeremiah is the prophet of God. The best way to understand that role is he was the mouthpiece for God. He was the one that took the words of God to the people of God. So God would speak to Jeremiah. He was the mouthpiece. He would take exactly what God said. He would take it back to the people. They didn't always like it. A prophet wasn't always popular because there's at times God told them hard things, but that was his role. So in verse 28, this guy comes on the scene named Hananiah. And scripture clearly says he's a false prophet. And so Hananiah comes onto the scene and he basically positions himself also as a prophet of God. And he goes before the people that were Jeremiah's audience. And he says this, God doesn't mean that about the exile. That's not what he means. He says this, I promise you, in two years, you're going to be set free. In two years, God is going to set you free, okay? So when Jeremiah is giving us verse 10, 11, 12, 13, 14 in there, he's he's responding to what this false prophet Hananiah said. So let's read just a little context about what Hananiah said. So let's go back to chapter 28, starting in verse 11. Here's what Hananiah says. And Hananiah spoke in the presence of all the people, saying, Thus says the Lord, even so I will break the yoke of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, from the neck of all the nations within two years. But Jeremiah the prophet went his way. Sometime after the prophet Hananiah had broken the yoke bars from off the neck of Jeremiah the prophet, the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah. This is what God told Jeremiah in verse 13. Go and tell Hananiah, thus says the Lord, you have broken wooden bars, but you have made in their place bars of iron. Verse 14, for thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, I have put upon the neck of all these nations an iron yoke to serve Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, and they shall serve him, for I have given to him even the beast of the field. And Jeremiah the prophet said to the prophet Hananiah, listen, Hananiah, the Lord has not sent you, and you have made this people trust in a lie. Therefore, thus says the Lord, behold, I will remove you from the face of the earth. This year you shall die. Because you have uttered rebellion against the Lord. And that same year in the seventh month, the prophet Hananiah died. Now, God wasn't messing around in this story. He was not messing around. He had assigned Jeremiah to be the prophet. Hananiah goes before the people and says, look, don't listen to Jeremiah. He's old. Nobody listens to him. God would never leave his own people here for 70 years. So I'm going to make you a promise. This this. Uh, bondage, this yoke that you've been put under, under King Nebuchadnezzar, give it two years and you'll be out of here. Well, God hears this, tells it to Jeremiah. Then God tells Jeremiah, you go tell him that not only is he a false prophet and he had no business lying to the people, but this dude is done. Like this is his last year, not as a prophet, but like as a man, like as a human, gone, right? 
So when we, when we are praying, God, I know the plans you have for me, we have to be careful because what we're really praying for is 70 years of exile, right? Right, so if you need to go get your tattoo touched up, this is, what this is, this is the context of this, right? It's not that, God, you just give me prosperity, you give me hope. I don't want to have a life of trouble. I don't want to have a life of pain. No, God's promises in Jeremiah 29, 11, listen to me, we're coming on the heels of 70 years of punishment. God says, look, I do love you. I am your God. I am the one true God and you are my people, but you have broken our covenant relationship. And remember, especially in the Old Testament, the way that a covenant relationship works is like this. When there's obedience, God gives blessings. When there's disobedience, God brings punishment. That's the whole narrative of what happens with God's people in the Old Testament. So when they disobeyed God to the point that he had to discipline them, their punishment was that he was placing them under King Nebuchadnezzar in Babylon for 70 years. And then he says, but I do have plans for you. I do have hope for you. I do have a life where you'll prosper. But as much as I'm promising you that, I'm also promising you that you're going to live out these 70 years. And when a false prophet named Hananiah goes and tries to change what God had said, God takes care of him. In verse 29, in chapter 29, look at verse 7. God says this, this is the directive that he gives the people before their exile. He says, but seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you into exile and pray to the Lord on its behalf for in its welfare, you'll find your welfare. So here's what God's saying. Look, this 70 year thing that my promises are gonna come after that, this isn't 70 years for you to complain. This isn't 70 years for you to whine and moan. He said, the city I'm sending for you, the directive I'm giving you is to pray for the city. Pray for its prosperity, pray for its welfare, pray for these that are holding you in bondage because from their prosperity will come your prosperity. And that is not what they wanted to hear. You know what they wanted to hear? They really wanted to hear what Hananiah said. It was like, dude, you get to go home. Like God's gonna send you home. You're gonna go back to your place. You're gonna go back to your people. But God says, no, not only is it gonna be 70 years before I fulfill the promise in 2911, but during those 70 years, I'm asking you to pray for the city, to pray for those who are keeping you, to pray for the oppression that you might be feeling. And that's not what they wanted to hear. And then God gives them the promise in verse 10, for thus says the Lord, when 70 years are completed for Babylon, then I will visit you and I will fulfill my promise to you and bring you back to this place. And God said, when the 70 years is over, I will bring you back and I'll release you from this. So here's what's interesting about this, is that the audience that Jeremiah is, is explaining this to, most of them will likely never see the end of the 70 years. This would be for a different generation. God is greatly punishing this generation because of their disobedience. And so here's what I think you may have heard in your life. Our graduates are probably hearing this a lot. And I heard this a lot coming up is that God has a plan for your life, right? God has a plan, one plan, a specific plan. God knows the place you're supposed to go to college. He knows what you're supposed to study. He knows where you're supposed to live. He knows what you're supposed to eat. He knows the friends you should make. He knows the one uh, that you're supposed to marry. He, know, he, he has all these things. And now you're launching out on this great spiritual scavenger hunt. So don't screw it up. All right, you can do it, right? And so when we get to this place as adults, we're like, we look back and it's like this song, Dear Younger Me, if I could go back, right? We have to be careful because I think the message behind this is true and it's almost theologically accurate because there's nothing more that I think will paralyze a graduate or will paralyze an adult is to think that if I make a misstep on this special plan that God has for me, somehow my own choices have thwarted God's best for my life. Like if I don't find exactly this, like God has this, it's one specific plan and it's only one plan. And I've got to make sure that I do everything the right way, that I make every right choice, that I'm never out of fellowship with God, that I'm never in a season of sin. Because if I find myself in any of those places and I miss a step on this one journey that God has for me, then the rest of it is over. That passage just can't mean that. And, and scripture just doesn't support that concept of God's will. God does have a plan for your life. He knows it. He knows everything you'll ever do. Scripture says he knows the number of hairs on your head. He knows all that stuff. He knows every single thing. But God has much for us. God has many plans for us. And we can't allow ourselves to be paralyzed thinking, man, if I take one wrong step or make one wrong choice in all of this, that but I am somehow missing God's perfect plan for my life. It's true. God uses people for specific things and it's right to understand. Nothing catches God off guard. These graduates are never going to do something. And God's like, huh, I did not see that coming. I thought they would do better, right? Same with adults. Oh man, I did not see them 
doing that. No, nothing like that catches God off guard because I think that God has plans for our life. And of course, he wants us to choose rightly. Of course, he has set the standard for us with his son that he's called us to holiness. And of course, he wants us to choose rightly all the time. But I think we have often wrongly applied the heart of what this means. And I think we should be cautious with that application of that God only has one plan because it, it can be paralyzing. It can cause us to make choices out of fear and choices out of anxiety rather than choices out of trusting the freedom that God has given us as people. So here's a couple of great reminders and I'll give you a couple of things to write down before you go home. One is this, don't think so highly of yourself to think that you can somehow mess up God's plans for your life, okay? We, we don't carry that much, okay? We can't think so highly of us that, that one sinful choice or one bad relationship or one thing that we choose, somehow that choice has such great power that it's thwarted all of God's plans for our lives. We just can't do that. We know this, that God loves us, that God's for us, that God has plans for our life. But at the same time, on our best days, we fall short of the glory of God. Scripture says that over and over again. On our best days, our choices are what? Filthy rags before the Lord. On our best days, we're gonna get it wrong. On our best days, we're gonna make bad choices. And so we can't live with this paralyzing fear that if I choose one thing, that my choices carry such great power, not just in my life, but great power in the economy of God that I, by one choice, have messed up God's plans. That's not true. And here's another reminder. Don't think so lowly of God to think that he doesn't care about our lives and he can't use our wrong choices to bring goodness and peace to our lives. Here's a couple things based on this text that I think are important to consider. The first is this, pursue God, not just God's will. Pursue God, not just God's will. You know, more than God tells us in the scripture to follow his will, he tells us to follow him. In fact, that was Jesus's number one way to draw people to himself, not to believe in me, not to commit your life to me, but what? To follow me. That's what Jesus said all the time. That was his invitation when he would teach. He would call people to follow him. And more than anything else in the scripture, God calls us to follow him, not to, not to follow his will, although he wants us to. But we can easily become paralyzed on or fixated on this, these specific steps. Like I gotta figure out God's will for my life in this thing, and then this thing, and then this thing. And do you know what can happen? And I think this is one of the great tragedies of living out the Christ life is that we can become so fixated on finding God's specific will for our lives that we can miss God in the process. We can pray so much, God, I need you to show me exactly what is next in this relationship. I need you to show exactly what classes to take. God, I need you to show me exactly what conversations to have at work. And we can become so fixated and so fearful on messing that up that we can miss the heart of God in the process. God wants us to pursue him, not just his will. Because do you know what happens when we pursue God? He leads us to all the places where we're gonna discover his will. When we pursue God, just him, where we pursue him deeply, we pursue him to abide in him. Do you know where he leads us? He leads us to himself. He leads us to his presence. He leads us to his word. And he leads us to the presence of the Holy Spirit, which are all the places that God's will is gonna be discovered anyway. So just pursue God. Graduate, just pursue God. He will show you his will. You love your Bible, be best friends with the scriptures. Adults, same for us. If we will just pursue God in a deep, intimate, abiding relationship, I promise that all the specific things we wanna know about his will for our lives and for our jobs and careers and family and relationships, all those things will be discovered as we pursue God. In his timing, he'll show us those things. So we pursue God and not just his will. And one thing I think is a, will be a great encouragement, it's been a great encouragement to me is this. When we pursue God, we're pursuing God's will, right? We are, when we are looking for God's will, we are in God's will, right? When we're pursuing God, that is the heart of God's will. What is God's will for our lives? Well, it's that we know him deeply. It's that we love him deeply. It's that we love him above all things. We love him with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength, right? That's one of the anchors of the scriptures. And so when we pursue God, we are in God's will. A lot of times when we're praying, we're asking for God's will where we're in it. Right, Because that's what he wants for our lives is to pursue him. You know, when we believe that God just has this specific path and you gotta make sure you step every single step the right way, don't mess up or you'll ruin everything, 
we can easily focus on finding all those elements and just miss God on the journey. And where I believe those specific things about life and career, family, I believe all those things are found in a deep abiding pursuit of God himself. So we pursue him relentlessly each day and through that we discover the specific elements of his will for our lives. Here's the second thing. We don't allow failures to be final. We don't allow failures to be final. Here's one of the great landmines with holding a theology that God only has one plan for my life and if I screw it up, I screw up everything. Because here's what happens. How many of you parents, let me ask you this, uh, and don't say it out loud if your children are in here. How many of you have ever had something your family was gonna do or the family was in the, uh, having a conversation and you had to discipline your kids or you said, no, we're not gonna do that. And they just said, well, I don't wanna do any of it then. If I can't do that, I don't wanna do any of it. So because this one part of it didn't go their way, they take themselves out of the whole thing. Like, well, then fine. I don't wanna be with you people anyway kind of thing, right? If we hold to this theology, like, God, there's this, there's this perfect straight path and man, I'm gonna get every step right. And I, if I mess it up, then I've sabotaged my whole life spiritually. The struggle with that is, is, is when we do misstep, when we do find ourselves in a season of sin, it's very, very easy for the next step to be, well, then what's the point of all of it? And if I've blown it with this relationship, if I've blown it with this choice and I know I've messed up God's perfect will for my life, then what's the point? Because everything else, I'm gonna be settling. I'm gonna be settling for less than God's best because I made one wrong choice or I was in one season of sin, so what's the point? And we can easily allow one failure to be the final thing and we just give it all up. God, I don't want to be any part of it. It's one of the, I think, the great dangers of this, of this concept of it's, it's only one thing. You got to find that one thing. That's why I believe God has many plans for our lives. And there may be plans that he has for us if we go this way, but if we take a wrong step and go this way, God may have greater things for us. And the reality is this, because God is so good, we might make a misstep, but because God is so good and he's so gracious that he turns this misstep into something good, half the time I don't think we even knew it was a misstep because he loves us that much. How many times in our lives, adults, have we taken a misstep, but we don't even know it because God used it for good, which makes us believe that was a good choice, right? Because we have this economy, if, if it goes bad, I made a dumb choice. If it goes good, I made a good choice, right? We, everything lives and dies and based on our choices. Well, so we make, God has some great things in our life. He shows us new things, new relationships. So we think, oh man, I must've made a great choice. No, it might've been a bad choice, but God's just good to us, right? So we can't allow our failures to be final and to say, well, I've made a bad choice or I was in a season of sin or I struggled a little bit. And so because I probably sabotaged the hole that God has for my life, I'll just keep living this way. We can't allow ourselves to do that. And as quickly we, quickly as we make those decisions, we need to remember the goodness of God. We need to repent quickly. God forgives quickly and he restores quickly. And we continue on the journey, not allowing our missteps, our failures to be final, knowing that God still has much for us. He has great things for us and he'll use our choices for our good and for his glory, even when we don't understand. And one of the things scripture teaches us, and this is found in first Peter, is that God's given us everything we need to live the life God has for us. Scripture says that he's given, by his power, he's given us everything we need for life and godliness. And the word power in that verse in Peter is, is talking about the power of the resurrection. So with the same power that God used to raise Jesus from the dead, he's given us that same power to, to make the choices he wants. Meaning when we receive the person of Jesus Christ and we are in a relationship with him, he doesn't leave us there he gives us everything we need, everything you and I need to be who God wants us to be, to say what God wants us to say, to think what God wants us to think. He's given us all that. Whether we're a new believer or an old believer, he's given us everything we need for life and godliness. He's given us his word. He's given us fellowship with him. He's given us the active ministry of the Holy Spirit that dwells within us. And he's given us each other. So we have everything we need for life and godliness. But even still, with all of that, you and I are gonna make poor choices at times. We're still going to mess up, even though we've got everything we need to not mess up. But in those moments, we can't allow those failures to be final. We still pursue God. We ask for forgiveness. We let God restore us, and we keep moving forward. We repent, we trust God, and we ask for help in future choices. And then the last thought is this. We trust God's plans and live with hope. Here's the great thing about, um, about what I believe understanding this passage in correct context is when I understand that God's will for my life may have a lot of different avenues that I can 
choose certain things, I can mess up, be forgiven, be set free, and that God still will use my life and still will use my relationships, all those kind of things. That sets us free to live with hope, that we can trust God, that we don't have to be paralyzed and wake up every day and think, man, I've got to choose everything right today or I'm going to sabotage the whole deal. No, we can live in freedom. We can know that God forgives quickly, he loves deeply, and he extends his grace to us. And of course he wants us to pursue holiness. Of course he wants us to find him, find his will and all those things. But we can trust his plans and live with hope and not live with fear because we talked about that in the last series, that fear paralyzes us. Fear leads us away from God. Fear leads us to self-protection. And we need to be set free from all of those things. And to live that way, it helps us live with peace. Of course God wants us to be diligent. He wants us to take every decision seriously. He wants us to ask for wisdom. Scripture says that. And he wants us to be wise in all we do. But at the same time, he wants us to live free because we've been set free. He wants us to live as free people. He wants us to live a life of joy, of hope, and peace. And things may not always go the way we'd like, but hopefully we've learned that we can trust him always. So the good news is, is that God doesn't have a plan for your life. He has plans for your life. Not just one thing. You're not under the pressure uh, in your sinful, depraved humanity to get everything right or you sabotage God's whole will and plan and purpose for your life. He wants you to pursue him. He wants you to know him. He wants you to trust him. And along that journey of abiding in Jesus and knowing God more, he'll reveal to us those specific things that he wants us to see. Some of his plans, we might see him and we obey him. Some of his plans, we might see him and disobey him. Some of his plans we may miss and discover that he leads us to something greater. But we can never believe that God is finished with us or that his plans have been somehow thwarted or sabotaged by our sinful behaviors. He loves us and has many plans for us. That's why this passage says, for I know the plans I have for you. Plans for welfare and not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. You know how that song concludes? That dear younger me, it concludes with this. At the end, the writer says, Dear younger me, if I knew then what I know now, condemnation would have had no power and my joy and my pain would have never been my worth. Think about this. If I knew then, older adults, if we knew then what we know now, condemnation would have had no power. Here's what this means. So for those of us in the room, and I'll put it this way so that we feel better about it. Those of us who have been on a long journey but not always in the right direction, we have to be very cautious of looking at our past choices and assigning a condemnation to ourselves that God never assigned. Because what does Romans say? Therefore, there is now no condemnation. And when we look back on our choices and say, man, I remember back then I messed it up. This is not where my life should be. God had something else for me, but I messed it up. What we're doing then is we are assigning condemnation to ourselves that God never assigned us. And it can cripple us and it can paralyze us. And whether we're a middle adult, old adult, or somewhere in between, God still has plans for our lives. He still wants us to pursue him and abide with him every single day so that he can show us what's next. He is not finished with us. So older adults like me that have been on a long journey but not always in the right direction, don't allow yourself to look back on things you've done and assign and blanket your life with the condemnation that God didn't. We've been set free and we've been forgiven. And as much as he wants these graduates to pursue his will, he wants it for us as well. But also for our graduates and those who are young in the faith, this is a great statement. Your joys and pains along the journey will never be your worth. Your joys and pains along the journey will never be your worth. Because we so easily assign ourselves, well, I did this. I made all these right choices, so look at me. Or I made all these wrong choices, so look at me. And we begin to let our choices define who we are. Well, if we are in Christ, then that's how we're defined. We are in Christ. So our choices, whether good or bad, don't assign our worth back to us. So the same struggle we have later in life where we blanket ourselves with the condemnation that God never condemned us, in the same time, those of us that are young or new on the journey, we can't allow the choices that we make as we're trying to figure it out to be our worth. Our worth is found in Christ, so we keep pressing on, on days when we get it right and on days when we get it wrong. That doesn't change who we are. We keep pressing on. We pursue God. We abide in who he is every day. 
single day. Because really the heart of this passage is verse 13 of chapter 29 when he says this, you will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. What a great promise for us as the people of God. Let me ask you to bow your heads and to close your eyes. The great truth and promise for us this morning for all of us is that God has plans for our lives. And he wants to reveal those plans to us. He wants us to discover them. But all those things that God has for us are discovered in our pursuit of God himself. And when we pursue God with our whole heart, he leads us to himself. He leads us to his presence. He leads us to the Holy Spirit of God. And when we learn to simply pursue the heart of God every day, to grow in spiritual maturity and intimacy with him, it's on that journey in the due time of God, as scripture says, that he will reveal all those specific things that can make us anxious, all those specific things about our life that we want to know. God will give those to us. But the great danger for us is to miss God in the pursuit of his will. And so let's, let's choose today to be people that simply learn to pursue God, to abide in him and to enjoy the journey. To know that he has hopes for us, that he knows the plans he has for us, a future and a hope of prosperity, of peace and love. And sometimes the, those hopes might be found in times of joy and sometimes those hopes might be discovered after a season of repentance and a season of discipline and pruning from the Lord. But in the midst of all those things, he is faithful and he is good and he loves us and he wants us to know him. So wherever you are in your relationship with God today, just know that God deeply loves you. He sent his son Jesus for you. And everything you need for life and peace is discovered in an abiding relationship with God through his son, Jesus Christ. If you're here today and you're outside a relationship with Jesus, right where you are this morning, you can invite him to be the Lord of your life. He will exchange your life of sin and depravity and give you a life of hope and peace that can only be found and discovered in his son. If you're here this morning and you say, McLean, I'm, I'm a follower of Jesus, but I'm just struggling. Renew your discipline to be in God's word every day. Renew, renew your commitment to pursue God, to pursue him and let him lead you to his presence. Let him lead you to his word and his truths. Let him lead you to the presence of the Holy Spirit where, where in those places he'll reveal to you the things that he has for your life. So God, this morning, wherever we are, we pray that you would help us to find you. God, give us the discipline that we need, the faith that we need to be who you've called us to be. God, help us not to be paralyzed with trying to unpack and discover specific things about our life and why you have us where you have us and what you're trying to teach us. And God, give us a deep passion, a hunger and thirst for righteousness to just know you every day. God, we pray for our graduates. We pray that they would, that they would love you, that they would be anchored to your word and that they would pursue you each and every day. And God, they would trust you and live with hope and freedom that you're gonna be with them and you're never gonna leave them or forsake them. And God, we pray the same for, our, for adults that are in the room and for kids. God, that you would show yourself true to us. God, you've always proven faithful and we know you're faithful to us in all things. And it's in Jesus' name we pray.